Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ali Aslan, a Washington correspondent and columnist for Turkish Daily Zaman newspaper and today's Zaman newspaper. Uh, it's a pleasure to be at a Rumi Forum today uh, for moderating a discussion with a very distinguished uh, uh, two colleagues of mine uh, from Washington Post. Uh, we have Raju Nerisati here as managing editor, he's the managing editor uh, of Washington Post, where he is responsible for all of the Post's online and mobile content and strategy, photo, graphics, and design departments, uh, Washington Post Live Conferences, Unis Content, and Capital Business, a weekly business publication. Uh, he, prior to joining to Post in January 2001, he was the founding editor of Mint, a business daily newspaper and website in India. Uh, earlier, he spent uh, 13 years at the Wall Street Journal. Um, he earned a BA in economics and sociology from Osmania University, Hyderabad, and a postgraduate diploma in rural management from the Institute of Rural Management, Anand. He holds a postgraduate diploma from the Times of India School of Journalism uh, as well. And it's great uh, to be with him uh, and at the same podium. Uh, by the way, he has, he's got his MA in journalism from Indiana University. Uh, and I have also uh, one other distinguished guest with Washington Post. On my immediate left, he's Doug Jail. He's the ad foreign editor of Washington Post, and he oversees all news coverage outside the United States. And, and uh, until August 2009, Mr. Jail was Deputy Washington Bureau Chief of the New York Times, uh, overseeing coverage of national security matters. And he led the members of a team from the Times that won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting in 2009 for coverage of the conflict in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, before becoming an editor, Mr. Jail spent uh, 19 years as a reporter uh, filing stories uh, from more than 40 countries. And as Washington correspondent of Los Angeles Times, he covered two presidential campaigns, the environment, war on drugs, and the White House. Uh, he also covered the conflict in Panama in 1989 and the Persian Gulf War of 1991, for which he was awarded uh, the Gerald Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on Military Affairs in 1992. Uh, at the New York Times, beginning in 1993, Mr. Jail served as White House correspondent as Middle East Bureau Chief, based in Cairo as National Environmental Correspondent, and then as a National Security Correspondent specializing in intelligence matters. In 2002, Mr. Jail was among a team from the Times that won a Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism for his reporting from Saudi Arabia during the months after the September 11 attacks. Uh, Mr. Jail graduated uh, f uh, in 1984 from Stanford University and in 1987 from Oxford University where he earned uh, a master's degree in international relations and was a Rhodes, uh, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he was co-editor of Whose Water Is It? Uh, the Insatiable Thirst of a Water Hungry World published by National Geographic Books in, in 2003. Uh, again, it's a pleasure. Uh, to be with you uh, today. Uh, I would uh, kindly ask uh, our guests uh, to, to do uh, some introductory remarks and, and then uh, we're going to start discussion. We want this dis discussion to be an interactive one uh, so it doesn't have to be only questions and answers. You can also make your own comments and join the discussion with us. Uh, and and uh, I would start with uh, uh, with Raju. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really um, appreciate you all of you coming. Uh, Doug and I had to walk just two blocks down to get here, and, and in this uh, really terrible rain. So thank you for coming. What I thought I would do was to um, just kind of talk a little bit about what's happening at the Washington Post over the last few years, um, and then um, let Doug talk about um, how we cover the world, uh, which is kind of his um, speciality. As, um, as most of you know, the newspaper uh, industry has been in a little bit of a trouble over the last uh, few years. Um, this industry has dealt with uh, worse recessions than the one we've dealt with <coughs> in the last two years. Uh, the problem has been that 
the recession has come at a time when there are really structural kind of shifts in the industry where a lot of new readers are not kind of coming to newspapers um, as a result of which um, it's been a very challenging um, environment to not only kind of keep your existing readership but also to kind of figure out a way how you can sustain enough revenue to fund the kind of journalism that our readers are used to from uh, you know, an organization like the Washington Post. It's not very different um, compared to some of the other papers, but we are in a, in a town that um, really likes content and the Post brand has been um, a brand that's been um, seen as um, a very credible, um, honest brand for a long time in this town. So it does give us certain advantages uh, compared to uh, other papers that are you know, also dealing with similar issues. Just to give you some context, in the last um, 10 years, about 170 newspapers have closed in the US. Um, and it's out of 1,400 newspapers. So it's a pretty significant um, um, problem and challenge for this industry. Um, the flip side of it is that there has also never been a better time to be in the news business. By that I mean there have never been more readers of news, period, than they are now. It just so happens that a large number of them consume news online uh, rather than in, through printed publications. And our industry has struggled to kind of figure out a way to kind of really um, make money online. So. We are dependent on the newspaper for our revenue. It's a, uh, and the newspaper audience is rapidly kind of um, slimming while the audience online is really growing and we haven't yet kind of figured out a way to really effectively make a lot of money. So it has caused, as you can imagine, and those of you who are readers of the Post know this, it's caused um, um, a lot of kind of stress in terms of being able to manage our costs we have significantly reduced our staffing. We used to be around 800, 900 people in the newsroom um, about three, four years ago. We are um, about 650 now. Um, 650 is a fairly large newsroom um, uh, to be able to cover uh, this community and offer the kind of content that people come to the post for. But it's been a challenge to kind of manage um, our resources um, um, in doing this. As a result, we've, over the last three years, really kind of uh, focused on a fur and about Washington strategy, which is to say that the reason why people come to post content, whether it's print or online, is because they really want to understand what's happening in Washington and what it means uh, to where they are. And thankfully, um, Washington has been involved in a lot more things than it's ever been involved in, whether it's running General Motors for a while or running um, our banking system or dealing with our real estate crisis. So as a result, it's been a great time for telling the kind of stories which explain why m more people are reading our content. The challenge remains still, how do we kind of effectively run this as a business where um, we make enough revenue so that you know, Doug can have uh, you know, 15 correspondents who can cover um, you know, all the way from Latin America to uh, Asia in an effective way because that's the kind of information that you're looking for. And it remains an interesting um, challenge. I'm not uh, sitting here and saying that the worst is behind us for this as an industry, but clearly we have gone through probably kind of, um, we have hit kind of a little bit of a, a trough, if you will, and it looks like this year, relatively speaking, has been um, better than the last two years. So it does look like there is some light at the end of uh, the industry's tunnel. There's a little bit of a myth out there that um, the newspaper um, industry um, is at some point going to kind of disappear. Um, at least at the post, we don't necessarily think that's going to happen um, because there still is a strong audience for consuming news in print, just as there is a growing audience in con consuming it online. And uh, what we've tried to do is to kind of make sure that our print audience continues to get what it is looking for in the post, but focusing more and more um, on the online audience. Just to give you an idea, um, 85, 86% of people who come to the Washington Post website don't come from this region. They come from you know, other parts of the US and all around the world. 
and they have very different needs sometimes compared to the audience here. So today, a lot of us are interested in weather in Washington, right? So if I play that up in a significant way on my website, 85% of the audience that's going to come to my website really, really doesn't care about that. So it causes some interesting challenges um, in how do we manage resources and how do we present our content in a way that appeals to both our online audience and our print audience. And this is where kind of focusing on this fun about Washington strategy and saying, is that something that people expect from the post? And if it's not, should we be re using our resources to do that? Uh, has been the filter that we've used internally to manage um, uh, over the last few years. And it is starting to kind of uh, help us focus um, on what we do best and partner with others in areas that we don't necessarily need to cover on our own. A good example of that is um, our business coverage. We focus on the kind of the intersection of business and politics or business and policy or business or regulation. But we've partnered with Bloomberg. So you get, if you come to our website, you get a lot of other normal business stories out of New York or LA or Chicago that we don't need to invest our resources. What we've then done is to kind of invest our resources in covering the White House, in covering Congress, in covering large parts of the world that um, matter to the U.S. and our audience and where the U.S. Uh, matters a lot. So it's been, a, it's been a few years of kind of rethinking what the post stands for, how we can use our resources better uh, to address the needs of both our print and online audiences. And, um, I'm much more comfortable uh, this year than I've been in the last couple of years in terms of um, the future of our business. You'll probably see um, a lot of experiments, especially online. You'll probably see papers like the New York Times figure out a way to start charging for content online. Um, uh, we may follow um, a different direction on that, but I think there is, there is a lot of effort going on in the industry um, to kind of figure out how do we create a sustainable business model so that we continue to serve both our print and um, online audiences um, and continue to serve um, the readers who have never shown a bigger appetite for um, the kind of journalism that uh, the Post uh, produces. So I'm going to kind of stop now and turn it over to Doug. And um, as Ali said, I think this was meant to be more of a conversation. So happy to answer any questions uh, later on. Doug. The uh, challenges facing the industry that Raju talked about uh, certainly have affected foreign news, coverage of foreign news. <clears throat> the major networks, a lot of major uh, American newspapers have cut back significantly, if, if not eliminated, their foreign staffs. And the Post hasn't been immune to those cuts. Our staff now, about 15 foreign correspondents, on st another five or so contractors is smaller than it was at that peak for three, four years ago when, when I think we had 26 uh, foreign correspondents. But this foreign about Washington strategy that Raju re referred to um, doesn't mean that all we care about is what's happening in Washington. The Post very much recognizes that what happens around the world is uh, enormously important to decision makers in Washington and also to readers who care about uh, what's happening and understand that what happens on a given day in Beijing or, or Kabul uh, or Mexico City often affects the way federal dollars are spent in the United States, the way decisions are made about soldiers' lives and the deployment of troops, a whole array of things. So when we talk about foreign about Washington, we don't mean a, a local newspaper strategy. We, need, we mean covering the United States and covering the world in a way that ranks priorities according to <clears throat> what is is most important, what's most relevant to an informed, educated, uh, uh, a cosmopolitan audience in Washington. Now, given the fact that resources are smaller, we've had to make hard choices. We've recognized that with a staff of our size, we can't cover all parts of the world equally. It would be uh, a mistake to try to compete head-to-head -head with the BBC or the wire services, or to some degree, even the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, which have larger foreign staffs um, than we do, and try to cover uh, 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 all parts of the world equally. So the, the tough decisions have involved going thinner, uh, reducing our staffing in, in Europe, in Africa, in South America, each by one correspondent, in order in the last year to really consolidate and surge our coverage across the Middle East, South Asia, and into China, which uh, 
uh, I think by uh, any measure, is the most dynamic part of the world uh, right now, the part of the world that is changing most rapidly, where the changes over the next decade are really going to have enormous importance in, in Washington, um, and certainly in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, or Iran, it's where the potential for uh, uh, direct American uh, military involvement, for example, has already taken place. So we have, well, we, we cover, uh, we do cover Europe, we cover Africa, we cover South America. Uh, our greatest concentration of, of, of resources is in that belt from, from Jerusalem to, uh, uh, to Beijing. Um, we try in, in our coverage to ask our correspondents to think about answering the questions that are most important to our readers, to recognize that they're writing not just about what's happening in their part of the world, but to think about why it is that it, that it matters that a reader in Washington or a reader of our copy online anywhere is going to need that information um, so that what we produce is relevant and important and feels connected to, to readers. Um, and one thing we're trying to do better in that process is to make sure that our reporting staffs in Washington and our reporting staffs overseas are talking to one another um, so that we're sharing both sides of, a, of, of an issue that is a matter of sort of current discussion in Washington. Perhaps the most important meeting I have every week is a conference call that involves reporters in Kabul and Islamabad uh, with reporters in, in Washington and sometimes elsewhere to talk about the wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan on everything from questions involving corruption to military uh, affairs to, uh, to political ones. It really helps I think um, us do a better job of, of, of reporting the issues and to have a clearer sense of, of, of what it is that is, is, is most important to our readers. Just, just to say, finally, as a, as, a foreign, as a former foreign correspondent, I know how liberating but also paralyzing it can be to be in a, in a foreign capital and to wake up knowing you could write any of, any of a thousand stories every day. It's a great opportunity, but it also is terrifying at, at, at times. And I think um, in some ways, uh, you know, a reader these days faces that same dilemma with that avalanche of information that we all get on our Yahoo homepage or in the CNN crawl or on our radio at, at, at night. And being a smart filter, deciding how to target your reporting as a, as a reporter, providing a product for a reader that reflects that sort of sophistication in, in, in targeting and deciding what the questions are we're trying to answer is what I hope is the additional value we're bringing to you all and others as, as readers of the posts uh, in foreign news. So let me stop there and um, okay. we can begin a conversation. Sure. Uh, thank you for those great introductions. Um, uh, we are all print journalists, so we all complain about the new life and new conditions uh, uh, of print uh, journalism uh, all over the world, not only in the U.S. I'm from Turkey. The conditions are similar, uh, uh, although Turkey is doing a little bit uh, uh, better perhaps economically nowadays, but especially in terms of competition with internet media and print journalism, uh, Turkish uh, newspapers are also suffering a lot. So my question is this. Many experts are saying um, perhaps uh, for the print journalism to survive better, it would, it would be good for them uh, uh, to focus more on specialization and perhaps doing more analysis uh, so that they can make uh, your, their product more attractive uh, as opposed to quick, hot news coming out from uh, the websites. What do you think about this? And is Washington Post uh, focusing more on uh, analysis? And or in general, what are your views on this? Well, let, let, me, let me start by talking about the foreign news piece and let, let Raj, you talk about the, the bigger one. But, but first, um, I no longer think of myself as a, as a print journalist, or at least I try to tell myself every day I'm not just a print journalist. We at the Washington Post are producing journalism for all kinds of platforms, whether it's the, pr the, the print product that most of us grew up uh, uh, on, or various digital platforms, whether the web or your mobile phone or the Kindle or, 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 the, or, or the iPad. And so while uh, we still hear in our newsroom 
my colleagues talk about the web people, I tell them we're all web people. But on the on the analysis, um, you, you raise specialization. You, you raise an important uh, point. In some ways, by framing our work around this forward about Washington mission, we are specializing in that sense. We're providing that that filter that says of all these stories we could be writing, what is it that's, that's most important? And certainly in foreign news. Um, uh, we have, uh, and, and, and elsewhere, and Roger, you can talk about it, we have put somewhat less of a premium on the routine, daily breaking news that, um, that has become in some ways a commodity that others, that others are, are, are doing in order to focus limited resources on a place where we can add more value. And so often, as the foreign editor, I'm inclined to tell a reporter it's okay uh, uh, to, f we, we will let readers understand about this development by using copy from the wire services, by using the Financial Times, by giving them a paragraph in our digest in the paper that lets them know this, this happened, by giving them a fuller account on the web and asking them to spend their time not writing a project that will be delivered four months from now, because that's another excess we don't want to do, but to delivering a piece the next, tomorrow or the next day that really uh, puts the news in context that even anticipates the news that lets readers understand uh, where uh, where we think things are going. So about two years ago, had you walked into the Post newsroom and said, are you a print person or are you an online person? About 600 people would have told you we are, we are mostly print, our stuff shows up online. About 90 people would have told you that we are online. The last two years, we've completely merged our newsrooms, which one was in Virginia and one was in uh, downtown DC, where now it's become a fully integrated newsroom. And I tell a lot of you know, students or even some of my staff that if they think of themselves as um, print journalists, they probably have a somewhat limited shelf life. But if they think of themselves as providers of great content, both analysis, you know, breaking news, and opinion, and provide that content where audiences want them, then they have pretty bright futures. So in some ways, it's become more and more artificial to think of print and um, online separately. Um, as the web has expanded, um, and as, in fact, as 24-hour cable news stations, television stations really grew, the role of uh, print in breaking news has been on the decline for a long time. You, don't, you no longer really kind of rely on being able to break news tomorrow morning in a paper that you put to bed like six or eight hours ago. So it has moved much more dramatically towards kind of providing almost as, you know, initially it was a second day story, and now it's almost like a third day story. Because all day you get the, the news in multiple ways, and you, when you come to the paper, you want to be able to kind of not just know what happened briefly, but where it's, what does it mean and where it's gonna go tomorrow. <coughs> I think that it's still a work in progress. We still occasionally have a story that you'll feel like you've read it Know, or you've heard about it or seen it like a, you know, eight hours ago. Uh, but the challenge is to kind of uh, make people feel like the newspaper added more value, either in making them think about an issue or you know, connect the dots or, um, or find new uh, approaches to s the same story that they may have heard or read you know, several hours before. So I think th it's a matter of, it's been evolving and it's, the technology is rapidly kind of accelerating that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm also curious <coughs> uh, about the new generation of journalists and uh, their their uh, their you know uh, responses to these new developments in journalism field. Uh, my particular question is: uh, At Washington Post, uh, do you feel that you're getting enough interest uh, from a new generation? Uh, who would like to be journalists, and did you see any decline in the level of people who want to be journalists and reporters? Uh, actually, far from it. I probably wouldn't be able to get a job these days if I started off now with my skills, uh, honestly. Um, uh, the young people that you see these days are real storytellers in a multimedia sense. They, can, they think video, they think f f audio, they think you know, good writing. Um, maybe in different degrees, 
but they seem to be coming out of um, you know, the Columbia's and other universities with a much better understanding of how to communicate with their audiences, how to inf involve their audiences in a much better way than when I did 21 years ago when I you know, did my master's in journalism. And as to the question about whether we are getting enough uh, people, unfortunately it helps to have uh, an industry in a downturn. Right? There are not that many jobs and not that many organizations that are hiring. So the choice is actually fairly dramatic now. I mean, Doug has um, uh, an opening in India, and we've had like, you know, probably 15 give or take applicants, and some of them are really, really strong candidates. And in, in if we had our brothers, we would hire about three of them. Right? So the choices are actually much better now, and I'm not saying it'll continue, but um, people coming out of journalism, Columbia is just about to start a, a master's in journalism and a master's in computer science offered together, because they understand that the future is going to be digital, and a journalist coming out with an understanding of that world would be a better uh, journalist. But the bottom line, and we constantly keep reiterating that at the post, not just to young journalists, but also to our seasoned journalists, is that the technology doesn't change the basic um, uh, right and wrong approaches to journalism. You still have to kind of have a strong sense of ethics. You still have to have a strong sense of fairness and balance. You still have to do your reporting. None of this is being replaced by Twitter or Facebook. It might make it easier or harder, but um, the basic pr principles of journalism are still very much intact, and I would argue that probably more so in an era when news is happening so quickly that you need to kind of make sure that your fundamentals of journalism are still uh, as strong as they've ever been. No. If I may, I'll ask one, one more question and then open the discussion uh, for our audience. And I'm shifting the topic a little bit uh, to more uh, uh, political issues now. 9-11, um, events so horrible events of 9-11 have had enormous impact uh, in, in the United States. Um, what do you think has been the effect to US media in general and to Washington Post in particular? Um. That's a great. That, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think. I, I think there was a period after a, a, after 9/11 uh, um, when the intense, when the interest and curiosity about um, uh, the Islamic world, in, in, in particular, grew in the in the United States. Certainly, you saw news organizations uh, do their best to help readers understand um, better um, where this. Anger that um, that uh, was behind the, the attacks may have uh, uh, come from uh, to understand uh, some of the, the subtleties and, and nuance in the Islamic world, um, uh, and I, and certainly whether it was that immediate aftermath or some of the wars that followed in Afghanistan and then in, and then in Iraq, we've had. Um, uh, an intensification of, of, of foreign coverage, particularly in the in the in the era of an Islamic world, I think I think that um, that those events in some ways reminded people that um, uh, that the world was a dangerous place, that um, uh, that there was a lot that they didn't know about it, and that news had a uh, had a value that they may have uh, felt they could gloss o gloss over during a period in the 1990s when. Uh, uh, the, the world seemed to be a, a more stable uh, uh, and uh, less dynamic place. Um, speaking parochi parochially, and then I'll let I'll, I'll let uh, Raju go. It's also been very expensive for for newspapers to cover uh, the events that have followed 9/11, uh, whether it was in wh whether it was in foreign news uh, per se, whether it was in in trying to uh, to understand better. Uh, the enormous amounts of money that were spent that have been spent since 9/11, uh, um, it's it's been uh, an, an expensive proposition, and and some of the belt tightening we've we've, we've seen lately particular uh, is in some ways to compensate for the enormous amounts of money that were spent then. But I'll say finally, it has uh, um, as I think the Post has shown in the series that um, pr produced this was was published in the last several months. Dana Priest and Bill Orkin did, called Top Secret America. Um, it uh, um, has again provided an opportunity for 
journalists to do that kind of basic accountability of how the government is spending its money um, and uh, well or poorly and um, uh, the secrets it, it's trying to keep. Um, Dana and Bill uh, in the Post uh, did an extraordinary job in getting to uh, the bottom of uh, an enterprise that has grown in the United States uh, right under our noses here in Washington to levels that um, uh, are almost unimaginable in terms of uh, uh, of, uh, of employees, uh, money spent, and a world that's existed um, under the umbrella of classification. I think it obviously it's early, but it remains to be seen whether 9/11 will define or will be the seminal event of this century, or it'll be rise of India and China, or it'll be something else. I think it's kind of a little early to kind of figure that out. And obviously, in the last 10 years, 9/11 has been the kind of the all-consuming, or its fallout has been the all-consuming event for the entire world, not just the U.S. And um, it has you know, spawned a whole bunch of uh, different strands. Some people could argue that our, our subsequent investments in the wars um, have you know, caused our deficits to go up and uh, caused our economic problems. So there, could, there are a range of kind of fallout issues that I think the media uh, has had to deal with. Uh, just on the Islam front, as Doug said, I think it's done two things. One is it's sharply increased the awareness of Islam, both in a good and a bad way. In a good way, in the sense that there are more people willing to kind of at least try to understand what it means um, if you equate 9-11 with Islam, which is not necessarily a direct equation anyway. Um, but it's also caused a lot of people to kind of become, um, you know, more um, 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 skeptical or more conspiratorial about these issues. Uh, you know, you drive up the, the New Jersey Turnpike, you see now a huge billboard that kind of says, why Islam? And it's like a group trying to kind of explain what Islam stands for. The fact that they need to do it now is both a good and a bad sign, because there's a willingness to understand what it is, but there's also a need for it, unfortunately, because there's a lot of myths and a lot of fallacies about it. So I think it's, the story still remains to be told, even you know, nine, nine years later. Thank you. Now it's time for our audience to join the discussion. Uh, I'll start with the lady on the front. Gentlemen, this is fascinating. I'm not even sure this is on. Is it? It's on. It's on. Okay, I particularly, I worked at the Columbia School of Journalism, by the way, and I worked uh, for the UN and also overseas. I'd love to hear, particularly from our foreign news editor, the dynamic between the foreign news editor and his or her team and the foreign correspondents that process of determining what's going to get written, the filtering of it, the, the back and forth. And I'm also curious in terms of what training do your folks get if they're going to a new part of the world? I know that David Shipler, I think, had some training in Russian before he went and served in Russia. Can you do that anymore? Give them that uh, almost kind of a crash course in area studies. Although on the other hand, you have people like some of your China people who are real experts in that in terms of language and history. And just quickly, I could ask many questions. In terms of the investigative pieces, you, you said in your early remarks about a story that would take a number of months to do. This isn't what you're thinking of. You want something maybe in the next two or three days. Maybe I misunderstood where you were going, but, but what about the investigative pieces for your foreign correspondence? Could you have someone do what Dana has done in this country in the foreign security area and the CIA. Do you have the resources for that? Yeah, all, 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 all great, all great questions. Um, uh, first, in terms of the, the training of, uh, of correspondents, uh, we continue to, to make sure that correspondents have have language training when they're going uh, to a, a country in which they in which they need it. Um, sometimes. Uh, we're able to do that simply by hiring someone <coughs> whose language is already quite good. Uh, our new correspondent in Baghdad, Leila Fadl, speaks uh, terrific Arabic, and that's really helped really helped her and made her an, an attractive candidate to us. Um, uh, we have fluent speakers of of, of Chinese, <coughs> of of Russian, uh, and other languages. It's it's harder. Uh, to be frank, to, to get the money uh, to send someone off to language school for a, for a year. 
I used to um, hear stories of colleagues who got to go uh, study Japanese in Monterey at the Language Institute for a year, and most of them didn't come up with very good Japanese, but they had a, they had a heck of a year in Northern California. But, um, but it is important, and whether the training is in security <coughs> or in language or in simply taking some time to read and, and steep themselves uh, deeply in, in a story, we want very much to, to do that. A correspondent who just lands as if the place is another planet isn't, um, isn't uh, in the best uh, shape. And, and, uh, and language is very, is very important. When I went to Cairo in 1995, I, uh, I heard two bits of advice from, from editors. One, the outgoing foreign editor said, you don't need to study Arabic. Anyone you, 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 speak to, you want to speak to speaks English anyway. Uh, fortunately, the incoming foreign editor had a different, uh, a, a different view. And I think that gulf actually reflects some of the insular nature of, of, of the United States and foreign correspondents before 9-11. Uh, before uh, good point on investigations. I didn't mean uh, to say that we won't do, we don't want to do long-form stories or deep investigations. Um, we've continued to do that, and we need to do that uh, all the time. We've been doing that in looking at the operations of Kabul Bank in Afghanistan and looking at the way U.S. money is spent um, and has been wasted in Afghanistan and Pakistan and and Iraq. Have some broader projects under uh, underway as as well. Uh, but it's always a but it's always a balance, and I think um, there have been times when uh, all these organizations get a little bit out of balance, and and sometimes uh, uh, begin to define the merit of a story uh, uh, according to how long it takes to produce it and how many column inches are devoted to it. And neither of those is the best merit of a story we're trying to produce for a reader, which is part of what the conversations with with, with correspondents are are about. I very much believe that you're, you're doing a disservice to a reader and a correspondent to just tell a correspondent, you decide. You're our eyes and ears out there. You tell us what you want. You want your correspondent to be the eyes and ears, but you also want to get a couple more brains involved in the story. You, you, want, to, you want to talk about what it is that, <coughs> that they're seeing, but you also want to be sure that they um, are aware and understanding what the what the what readers want to know, what the questions are, and the best conversations are when you marry those two perspectives and produce a story that gets at the ground truth and answers the questions uh, that uh, uh, that your readers need to have answered. Just to add to that, um, while we have a significant effort at like trying to bring keep our costs down, a large part of that has been kind of figuring out can we kind of take out some repetitive tasks, can we put in a better editing system, can we not have a lot of duplication of work, to try to preserve as much as possible the money that we spend on uh, reporting. Um, sure, I mean, if you went to s 10 trips for something, uh, chances are that you'd probably make six trips. But it's still driven by um, a great story and an idea. If somebody comes and says that, you know, here's a story and there's a proposal, Almost never, even in these tough years, have we said, you know, for money reasons, don't do that story. So that's still not been the case. I mean, the project that Doug talked about was Top Secret America, which literally took two years. I, I would hate to have all my projects take that long. But there are not that many news organizations in the last decade that have given that kind of time and uh, resources to kind of say, let's go do that, because that's important for us to do as an uh, organization, and it's important for our audiences. So. We've spent a year, year and a half covering the Mexican drug wars in a, in a very intense way and um, you know, didn't necessarily have to do it, but it was a great story and we felt like we were the best at telling it. And we continue to tell that story. Um, we don't kind of drop the ball and move on to the next one now that the, you know, last year's Pulitzer season is over. So. Ambassador Mack? I'm David Mack from the Middle East Institute. And first of all, uh, congratulations to the Washington Post for getting Doug Jell away from the New York Times. Thank you. That's a real coup. Um, it is. But uh, uh, my question is to Doug, and it's good to see you again, uh, and that is, why did you let the New York Times take Anthony Shadid, your star Middle East reporter, away from the Washington Post? I was going to thank you for your kind remarks. <laughs> stuck a needle into my in, 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 into my ribs. Losing Anthony was a, was a, a great loss. 
Uh, we were uh, glad that he won yet another Pulitzer for the Washington Post uh, last year. Um, but um, uh, you know, people's careers are long and, and, and lives are long, and for their own reasons, sometimes people feel a need to, a need to make a change. Uh, and I wish we hadn't uh, lost Anthony, but I'm doing my best to provide Middle East coverage of the uh, sophistication and, and authority that he's been able to provide, first for our readers and, and now for the Times. And when uh, the Rumi Institute has Bill Keller up here the next time, do ask him about Karen Tamalty. <laughs> <laughs> or if they bring the Wall Street Journal, ask him about Doug hiring Andy Higgins, one of their best people. So it, this is, you know, it happens. Any more questions? Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, obviously, especially after uh, the war on Iraq, uh, the image of the U.S. in the world has declined a lot. Um, how has, has, has this made any effect on the Washington Post's access to foreign governments or other societies in the world? That's the uh, first part of my question with access. And also I'm curious uh, about uh, your uh, perception with the access with Obama administration. How do you compare it with the Bush administration? I can, I can talk about the access to the, to the world, um, uh, which is always a complicated uh, question. When I was based in the, in the Middle East, I think I was responsible for 19 countries, and I could get read, I could readily get access to maybe four or five or six of them. The others always involved the process of a visa and permissions and and and, and all of that, and that continues to be a problem for foreign correspondents. Less, I think, because of uh, perceptions of the of, of the United States, although that factors in, and more because of a desire to, to control access to their uh, to their countries. Um, <coughs> I, I, if we're talking about the Iraq War, I think the problem for correspondence has, uh, and, and the fallout from 9-11 has less had to do with access to governments than has had to do with, with security and, and, and safety, frankly. Um, uh, when I was in, in the Middle East, I think most of the time I, I, I never felt safer uh, on the streets of, of Cairo or, or Riyadh or, uh, or, or Damascus or Baghdad than uh, I felt safer there than I did in, in, in New York. I, I, would, I probably wouldn't say the same thing of some of those places um, today, and that does have to do with uh, uh, sentiment, uh, anti-American sentiment that has become at least much more visible than it was 10 years ago. I think even if um, in some countries the, um, their sense of the U.S. government's importance has gone up or gone down after 9-11, I think their desire to kind of reach out to the American people at large is still very much there. And oftentimes, because of the Washington Post being where it is, it is seen as a proxy to kind of communicate what a you know, head of state in you know, a different country wants to communicate to the Congress or to the administration. And so we haven't seen any noticeable change in people either responding to our requests or wanting to come in and talk to us. It's quite common for an embassy to contact us and say, you know, a prime minister or, or a vice president is coming through. Can he come and spend some time with the editorial board? That we haven't seen um, uh, much of a change. There are some countries where um, just getting visas and permissions um, has always been hard, whether you're the post or not, hasn't made much of a difference and hasn't made much of a difference in the last uh, uh, decade or so. As far as access to the White House goes, um, I don't think it's been, it's been an issue of whether the Bush administration or the Obama administration. I think it's, if you're a White House press office, you are now dealing with double or triple the number of requests. It you know, used to be that you, you dealt with the big papers and the big networks and the occasional NPR and you were fully covered. Now you have to deal with you know, the Huffington Post, the Politico, and you have to deal with a whole bunch of requests. So in trying to be fair and in trying to kind of not seem like they're partial to one set of media or the other, I think it takes a lot longer to kind of get at your turn. Um, and they're also doing a lot more kind of group events rather than one-on-ones as well, just to deal with the number of requests. So it's more of that, the proliferation of media, than anything to do with the Republican administration or uh, 
uh, Democratic administration. Half my readers think we are liberal, half my readers complain we are too right wing. So it, somehow we are doing the right thing, it looks like. <laughs> One more question, please. Okay. Um, this is a, a domestic question. You mentioned Politico and the Huffington Post, and you also mentioned the special niche of the Washington Post, the Washington focus, the incredible networks reporters have and editors. But has not Politico particularly, uh, with Mike Allen, who used to be one of your, mm -hmm. your star reporters on domestic stuff, Hasn't that been a competitor in some ways for readers' interest? And, and how now with this proliferation, not to mention Slate and a whole lot of other online uh, politically focused entities, what does that mean in terms of your particular value added and your particular strengths in covering the Washington world? Uh, Politico um, isn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't just competition uh, in recent days, it still is an active competitor. We look, we look at any news organization out there, whether it's on the web or anywhere else, as competition. And obviously, Politico, uh, credit to them, has done a really good job in, in at least the perception game of uh, being up on the ball in terms of politics. So there are multiple ways of dealing with it. Um, before I get into that, if you look at the absolute numbers, um, and purely online numbers, as to how many people read the Washington Post politics stories versus how many people totally go to political, we're probably double or triple their size. They've always been, the lead has always uh, continued and it, that hasn't changed. The sheer number of people who consume our politics content online versus theirs. But we've, um, you know, we've created a new um, mini website, if you will, called postpolitics.com. And you know, some of it is in response to these niche sites because they have the advantage of, if you go there and your prism is a politics, you feel like it's all politics. Well, if you come to the Washington Post homepage, you could get an earthquake, you could get a fire, you could get you know Michelle Rhee, and you could get a dollop of politics. So the idea is that there are a large number of people whose worldview is politics or sports or local. We will give them different access points through post politics, post local. So that's one way to compete uh, with them. What is that? What it has meant for our newsroom is that um, you know the typical newspaper reporting cycle which used to be come in at 9.30, read some papers, talk to some of your colleagues, you know, go do some reporting, come back, have lunch, do some more reporting and write and turn in a story at 7 p.m. And, you know, and then you're done for the day, has really changed dramatically. Our, you know, lots of our columnists, uh, Chris Saliza, who runs the Fix column, one of the most popular politics columns, files at all hours of the you know, day and night. You know, he tweets, he, he blogs, he sends news alerts, and so I think the cycle has become almost a 24-hour cycle uh, for a lot of uh, the journalists. Um, and their ability to kind of not just have to depend on the printed post platform to reach their audiences has really kind of changed as well. Uh, lots of them have thousands of followers on their Twitter um, feed. Um, they have like a Facebook page and they have just a lot more avenues to do that. So, and competition isn't really, um, you know, becoming less, honestly. Uh, Politico's um, affiliate TBD.com is a local site that just launched a few months ago, and it's a local website. So we have to kind of make sure that we are our local website, uh, you know, is competing effectively with them. Both Comcast and ESPN want to start Washington D.C.-based sports websites, which means my sports team has to now kind of make sure that we compete with them on those terms effectively. AOL has started something called Patch.com, which is just a neighborhood website. So suddenly we have to now deal with AOL about Bethesda and about you know uh, Fairfax. So it's it's um, it's just going to be the way it is. Um, I think competition is only going to get uh, pretty intense. What we have going in our favor is the Washington Post brand, this trusted journalism. Obviously, all our, our deep analytical and reporting strength and uh, fairly strong editing strength. So if we can continue to do all those and take advantage of all the technologies that are out there. Um, now when Facebook has 500 million people on Facebook, it'll be a mistake to expect them to come to your website. You have to be where they are. So in some ways, we were the first big website to really embrace Facebook. And if you go to our website now and you log on using the same login, you can see what everything your friends are doing about Washington Post without leaving our site. To me, that's kind of how 
so-called old media is actually kind of be, you know being very um, reactive and kind of embracing change. Yeah. One last question. Sitka, Rumi Forum. Uh, my question is about the, the foreign coverage. As you mentioned, due to the financial crisis, most of the media organizations had to scale down some foreign offices and etc. So didn't this uh, cause result in relying more on uh, some other organizations, uh, given the, the brand uh, of Washington Post? Uh, didn't, they, didn't this make you rely on some news agencies or local news organizations uh, and about the decision-making process of scaling down this, the, this foreign coverage or uh, the foreign correspondents, which areas are selected and how? The, the most problematic ones are remaining, uh, remain and s still continue working or how was the process? Uh, you're right that with that with fewer correspondents, uh, we we need to look to other organizations to supplement our, our our reporting. We have a partnership with the Financial Times that allows us to use uh, some of their content each day, in which we provide some of our uh, of our content. That helps to expand our coverage to places where we're not. We tend to use them sometimes for news about Europe, about Brussels, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, other places, Eastern Europe, where our coverage isn't as isn't as great. We do also rely on 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 wire services uh, more often. Or we need to rely on wire services sometimes to fill that um, uh, that niche. Uh, but I, but with a staff as, as as large as ours, we're still looking primarily to to our correspondents to be the to be the filters. The the, the in making those decisions about where about where you send correspondence and, 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 and where you don't. Um, I came to the job just over a, a year ago. Uh, in thinking it through, I tried to talk to people and do some thinking about what the most important stories out there were and, and what they were going to be. And my rough list um, uh, uh, ranked in the in the top tier uh, the question still unanswered of what was going to happen with Iran internally and, and, and externally, the, the, the urgent question of Afghanistan and, pa and, and Pakistan, the broader uh, question, uh, um, uh, I think, involved in, in, in Iraq, but much more broadly, the, what I call the wither Islam question, uh, the, the, the question of, of whether the fallout from 9-11 from is going to uh, evolve into a world in which um, the sentiment of the uh, of the Islamic world is more or less a lot <coughs> against the, uh, against the United States. Climate change is up there on my list. The rise of the rise of China and India. Um, uh, the broader questions of the of the economic fabric in the in the world. Thinking about th that list and bouncing that off of people helped make some of the hard decisions, which uh, were again that while I would have liked to keep bureaus open in Johannesburg, in Rio de, Je de, Je de Janeiro, in Berlin. At the moment, I couldn't justify keeping those open while not providing the coverage that I thought we needed to in Cairo, which is soon to be reopened, in, uh, in, uh, in Islamabad, which we uh, hadn't opened, or the depth of the coverage in China that we're, tr that we're trying to provide. So it was that kind of process. And there are no clear answers. We're trying to get a correspondent back in Berlin in the next year. I would love to have deeper coverage of South America and Africa. But given the resources and the priorities and what I think are the, you know, what I, the way the world is evolving over the next 10 years, that's the way we've set them. OK. Um, if I think there are not any more questions. And we're actually out of time. Uh, thank you so much for listening and thank you for wonderful uh, uh, presentation thank and you see you later thanks, thanks.